Alright, so in this video we're going to be discussing uh, binary ionic compounds and let's break down that term a little bit. First of all, binary compounds are compounds that contain only two separate elements. Now ionic compounds are compounds in which uh, electrons are given or taken by different elements and in ionic compounds uh, the two elements in this, in this case will form uh, ions of either positive cations or negative anions. And within these various compounds, the total number of positive uh, ions has to balance out the total number of negative ions. So I'll give you an example of a binary ionic compound. Let's take uh, magnesium and bromine. Now magnesium is an alkali earth metal, which means that when ionized, it tends to have a 2 plus, that is it gives up two electrons and bromine, which is a halogen, will take on one electron. So it tends to have a 1 minus. Now, when you combine these two, the total number of positives and negatives have to cancel out so that the compound becomes neutral. So what you'll find is that for every magnesium you have, which has two positives, you're going to need two bromines so that you can have twice as much negative to balance it out. And the way you write this is by writing the one magnesium, there's a one down here that you don't normally write, and then the bromine next to it. And you have to specify that there's two bromines using this subscript. Now there's a much simpler method for figuring out uh, how many of each atom are within these binary ionic compounds. Instead of thinking it out like this every time, what you can do is, let's say we're combining uh, aluminum, or aluminium and oxygen. First what you do is you take uh, the monatomic ion they form and write the charge up here. So in this case aluminum forms a 3 plus ion and oxygen forms a 2 minus ion. Then what you do is you rewrite the elements down here as you would when they're combined and you cross over the two numbers as the subscripts. So in this case, you'd end up with a compound that is two aluminums and three oxygens. And if you do the math, you multiply two by six to get six positives and three by two to get six negatives and add them together, you get the net charge is zero. This doesn't work perfectly every time, however. For instance, if the two elements have the same uh, coefficient to their ion uh, number, for instance, magnesium has a 2 plus ion and oxygen forms a 2 minus anion. If you cross them over, as we did before, you'll get Mg2O2. Now that's not the correct formula unit because these two have a common denominator, which is 2. So what you can do is you divide by that common factor, 2, and you end up with the true formula unit, which is MgO. And you check your work again by using this greatest common factor. So in this instance, the two subscripts, which you don't write, are 1 and 1. And the greatest common factor is 1. So you know that uh, this is the lowest possible formula unit. And the same goes here. 2 and 3 are both, both prime. So their lowest common factor is 1. And in the magnesium bromide, the subscripts are 1 and 2 which have a GCF of 1, so the subscripts can't be reduced any further, and you know that is the lowest common uh, formula unit. Now, naming these compounds is very easy. You just take the chemical formula you had before, let's say, Al2O3. You just write down the name of the cation, and in this instance, it's just aluminum. And you take the name of the anion, in this case, oxygen. You take off the end and replace it with the suffix "-ide". So this compound is known as aluminum oxide. Now the system isn't as straightforward when you get two elements like iron, which can form two cations, that is Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. So what you do, let's say you had uh, iron oxide, what you would have to do, in this case you're using the Fe2 plus ion, 
you would have to write iron with the Roman numeral like we discussed previously and then just the name of the anion in this case oxide or if you were to do uh, iron nitride you would again have to specify in this case uh, this compound would be called iron 3 nitride so now we're going to be looking at naming molecular compounds which in case you couldn't tell by this chart over here on the left rely on various prefixes uh, to get their names so if we start with a very familiar molecular compound like let's say water what you do is you take the element that's in the earlier group in this case hydrogen and you write that down in its full name and then you find the number of that element in this case two and you go over to your chart and you find what's the prefix for two in this case it's di so you write that prefix in front of the first element and then you move on to the second element and you see okay uh, what is this element it's oxygen and then you take off the ending much like in ionic compounds and replace it with ide now then you go over and you find the prefix for the number in this case for oxygen there's only one so you use the prefix mono in which case you write dihydrogen monoxide now you'll notice I wrote monoxide instead of mono dash oxide and this is because when one of the words starts with a vowel you usually drop the vowel that's on the end of one of these prefixes for example if there were six oxygens you would write hexoxide instead of hexaoxide it just makes it smoother to say and they use this naming nomenclature in order to better communicate how many of each element are abundant within a certain chemical and just for another quick example let's say we had NO2 again you would take the element from the earlier group in this case nitrogen and you would write it out nitrogen but because there's only one and it is the first element in this compound you don't use the prefix mono you just leave it alone and the same rules apply now that applied to the earlier uh, water example you take the second element oxygen you write it out like I did up here cross off the ending and replace it with ide so you now have the word oxide you write that down and use the proper prefix for the number of atoms within that compound in this case you'd use the prefix di so NO2 if you were to you know have a bottle and want to communicate to your lab partner and whatnot that they should pass it over to you you would say pass me the nitrogen dioxide you wouldn't say pass me the mono nitrogen dioxide it just again makes it smoother and easier to uh, communicate without any confusion so the last thing we're going to be covering in this video are uh, acids and salts now acids we're gonna study more later on but the first thing you need to know is that there are two main types of acids there are binary acids and what are called oxy acids now binary acids are composed of hydrogen and one other element usually a halogen now oxy acids on the other hand are also composed of hydrogen as you'll find out later is a main component of uh, acids however uh, they also contain oxygen and one other or one or more uh, non-metals now you name binary acids based on the element that they're attached to for example uh, HF which contains fluorine is known as uh, hydrofluoric acid HCl is known as uh, hydrochloric acid etc and it goes through the same pattern with the ic uh, suffix as you go down the halogens likewise the oxy acids are named for the group that the hydrogen is attached to for example the compound H2SO4 
which as you can see has a polyatomic ion of sulfate, is called uh, sulfuric acid. And this applies to other compounds like uh, nitric acid. HNO3 has uh, nitrate in the compound, which is where the acid drives its name from. Now, salts aren't just something you use to flavor your food. They're technically uh, an ionic compound that is composed of a cation as well as an anion that is derived from an acid. So, for example, uh, NaCl, which is in fact common table salt as we know it every day, contains a chlorine anion from uh, hydrochloric acid, HCl. 